21 days to go. And today, uh, IBC Commissioner Dr. Rosalina Kombe joins me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yvonne. So, 21 days to go, huh? Yes. Yeah, yeah, all right. I'm sure you're feeling the pressure, so let me just I get do. straight into it. <laughs> um, I think let's start by talking about the issue that is, uh, you know, in the domain right now, and that is on, on, on the ballot, uh, presidential ballot uh, tender. Um, without discussing the merits of the case, because this is something you have already filed in court, some are asking, why are you filing an appeal at this time with 21 days to go, when the Commission itself has said that there's not enough time uh, to tender a fresh but then going into an appeal at the same time. Thanks, Yvonne. It's nice to be back here. You know, the last time I was here, we had a whole 120 days to go. Yeah. So now That's it's right. only <laughs> yeah. about 20, 22, 23 days uh, if you count all the nights. Mm -hmm. So it's a pleasure to be back here. I mean, I think there were some fundamental reasons why the Commission thought it wise to appeal the case. I think it was the first time in this country that a case had been determined on the basis of public participation. So the Commission wanted to have an understanding of what it means then to talk about public participation, but also it's the larger implications that has on the rest of the processes. So we want, we want to have some sort of clarity. Does it mean that the flat jackets that we have bought, the pens that we have bought for the entire process or the kits that we have bought for the entire process uh, could, could lead to the election result being nullified or questioned because there was no public participation in those processes. Yeah, but the public participation was questioned specifically to do with direct procurement. No, it was general actually. It is a general concept of, uh, of public participation in procurement processes, not just in the direct procurement. I mean, and obviously, yes, we have had cases in which we have done direct procurement of other uh, things that we have used in the, in the Commission. So I think it was important, just as a public policy issue, to get some sort of clarification on, on that, what is, the, what is the implication, and because we also don't want to put the country in a situation whereby somebody tomorrow will go to court and say that the pens that were used for, to procure to, for the election were not done through a public procurement process. So, so that was one part of it. But I mean, it's not like the Commission went ahead with that. We're conscious of the time. It's not that we went ahead with, the, with, with that and then sat back and we're not doing anything about it. The Commission has been sitting, you know, spending nights and days looking at various options uh, so that in case this happens, what will we go by? So we, we have several options that the Commission is considering on moving forward. And actually, we have been doing the public participation as outlined in the, in the, in the, in the, in the High Court. And uh, we have received, uh, you know, we appreciate the letters we have received so far. We have received quite a number of letters from Kenyans expressing their views on this company or that company. Uh, we are doing an analysis of those uh, letters that we have received mm -hmm. and uh, we'll make uh, the results of that uh, public uh, once we finalize the analysis of uh, their analysis. Okay. Regarding particularly this company and, and this uh, tender to print the ballot papers, mm -hmm. um, some contrast between you know the procurement that was done this time for this election and that that was done for 2013 and some saying there was an insistence by the commission to go with al -Gurir, particularly because this tender was awarded in october last year and we know the chronology of events with that even with the public procurement uh, you know um, advisory board on the same but some question why start to tender this process in October when the political party primaries had not even been done, when the number of candidates had not even been determined, how then would you be able to determine the cost of the tender itself when you had no idea in October how many candidates there would be and therefore how many ballot papers the commission would need to print? You know Yvonne, there's something called good public governance uh, practices and ballot papers are going to be needed in this country one way or another whether you're going to have a by-election you, you're going to have their basic things as an election management body you know that you're going to need at any time and good management practice in many places is, is, is ensuring that you then what you have a framework uh, agreement in place. You have a framework contract in place and that is what the Commission had been trying to do from October last year. It's a framework agreement in which you know that you're going to need a certain, you're going to need presidential ballot papers, you're going to need uh, you know, senatorial ballot papers. So what you do in that case is that you have a framework agreement that allows you then to come up with the specifics on the quantities 
but it's a framework, a general framework agreement. It's, it's best practice. We've seen it happens, happen here. I mean, we have, we have such agreements with hotels, for instance, because we know as a commission we're going to need to be at KICC at some point. So rather than waiting on, on everyday basis and calling KICC and saying we need to use your facility today, you have a framework agreement. It's, it's, it's a provision that is there in the, in the law. And that is what the commission was trying to put in place all the way back in October. And it made sense because you, you know you're going to have an election anyway on the 8th of August. So it only makes sense to start preparing yourself early. But unfortunately, the politics and the vendor wars are the reality that we have, and that is where we are right now because of the politics and the vendor wars. But had the commission been allowed in October to proceed as it was going, we wouldn't be dealing with the issues we are dealing right now. All right, and yet we find ourselves here where we are. So with 21 days to go, with the IBC seeking, mm -hmm. um, you know, advice from the Court of Appeal on this issue. Are you confident that this is something you will be able to do? We've got 21 days to go. Um, the printing of presidential ballot papers still hangs in the balance. Um, I know you talked about a number of options that you were looking at, but for our viewers watching today who are saying we've got 21 days to go, uh, and remember the presidential ballot is the one that is most contentious, what mechanisms are, you in, are in place or what assurances can you give to viewers uh, watching us tonight that with all the situations and all the situation analysis that this will be ready on the 8th of August? You know, Yvonne, we've been working hard and I can look you in the face and look the Kenyans in the face and say with confidence that we will be able to have the ballot papers on time for purposes of the election. We have several options as a commission that we've been looking at. That is what the Kenyans, the Kenyans give us a job. They give us a leadership position. And with leadership, you have to look at various options. You have to have your plan B, you have to have your plan C, you have to have your, your plan D. And uh, we are confident with the various plans that we have in place. If one fails, another one will pick up. And when we are ready with those options, we'll make those options uh, uh, available to the Kenyans and public. But for now, the most important thing that the High Court had asked us to do We've already done. Mm -hmm. That is the public participation. Mm -hmm. We have received the inputs from the Kenyans. We, we've had our technical team look at the various options available for us, and we can confidently, and Chairman Chibukati has confirmed this, that we can confidently tell the Kenyans that we will be able to have the ballot papers here. You see, it would have been difficult, Yvonne, if we didn't have ballot papers for all the other positions, mm -hmm. at least for all the five other positions. They are ready. We are expecting shipment to begin from this coming week for the rest of the ballot papers, what we are left with is the presidential ones, and we can assure Kenyans that we are working on that and that we'll deliver on that one. All right, let's uh, talk a little bit about civic education. Mm -hmm. That this time around has started rather late in the day. Are you confident that, you know, the 19 million plus voters are aware of their rights and their duties and their responsibilities mm -hmm. as voters? Um, Remember, let me take you back to 2010 when we had uh, the referendum on the new constitution. Mm -hmm. It was a fairly simple question as to whether you want the constitution. It was a yes or no. And still there we had about 200,000 spoiled votes. Uh, you know, now we've got six levels uh, of voting. Why has civic education been left till so late in the day? And do you think this will disenfranchise the voter? I think we are, if you see... If you do your surveys around the country, we've actually beefed up now our voter education campaigns. Uh, we have now recruited all the staff that are supposed to be doing the voter education. Unlike 2013, we now have all the material for voter education uh, in, the, in, the, in the various parts, in the various constituencies. I mean, we had had reports before in 2013 whereby the voter education material was arriving after the election. I mean, now we have all the voter education material, the manuals there. We have accredited a number of organizations that are out there doing uh, voter education. We'll be running programs on television this coming week with the support from the UN Development Program, UNDP, and, and IFES. And you might see that, you might have seen that we've already started our online uh, voter education campaigns. We have a lot of, um, you know, programs that are showing how to vote that we have put on our, on our Twitter account, on our website, and we are also transmitting them online. We've also, with the support of IFES, kicked out a very specific uh, campaign that is um, uh, focused on the youth, uh, Why Vote? And we are hoping that that will increase the, the participation of the, of the yeah. youth in, uh, yeah. in the voting. And you mm -hmm. talk about young people, a lot of them, you know, even by the numbers and the yeah. statistics that you yeah. put out, will be first-time voters. Yes. 
Three weeks to the election, when the political rhetoric is at an all-time high, we're seeing the politicians on rallies. I mean, in one day they are traversing, you know, they have, what, 10, 15 pit stops. Could this have been done earlier at a time when um, perhaps things, you know, temperatures weren't as high and now, you know, perhaps the IEBC voter education message will get lost in this political rhetoric? Actually, um, Yvonne, the, when we've, we've worked with adult uh, educators, we have worked with people who've, who have experience in coming up with, with curriculum and programs. And actually, the opposite. What they had explained to us is that the earlier you provide, if you provide this information too early, then you have a chance of it not being applied when you need it and that you need to intensify it actually as you get closer to the election rather than much earlier where you end up losing that information because some of these is things that you need people to memorize just before they go to an election and so there is value in ensuring that the next three weeks we really focus and we are focusing on that and you're seeing you're going to see a lot of flooding in in the media houses and different schools and different institutions of voter education because those are that is part of what experts in in in, uh, in adult education have told us that this is the right time actually to focus on voter education all right um let's talk about something that you know was a furore in the country just a short while ago when we're talking about the complementary system um, you know of voter identification um, and of results transmission mm -hmm. um, Rosalind what is that complementary system of identifying a voter what is that complementary system mm -hmm. that IBC has in place of results transmission okay. should the Kims fail so our default method the one that we would really wish to do is this one, mm -hmm. whereby you are using the KIMS, you get yourself identified, you just have to put your finger there, and you get identified and you vote. And this is the best method, this is what our preference would be, and this is what we've been investing a lot of time and money doing. In the case that this, uh, you, are, you, are as a, you as a voter are not being able to be identified, so you have two levels of complementary mechanism for identification. You have one uh, method that is basically also part of the KIMS, whereby in case your fingerprints, let's say you don't have fingers, because it's only the fingers that we're using, uh, you're not able to be identified using your fingerprints. Mm -hmm. the, the, the second method is, uh, is also electronic. Which is? What happens is that they will bring your, your, you'll bring your national ID card, mm -hmm. and uh, we can scan, this, this, this tablet can scan, your national ID card and once it scans it then your information pops up or we can also uh, there's a place here where we can swipe the the national ID card and once we, we swipe that national ID card your information should come up on this kit mm -hmm. and we still consider that complementary because for us the primary way of identifying you is biometrics okay so we consider that by uh, and, complementary. and what happens if it fails to scan the ID. I mean, if it are, fails to scan, gadgets and yeah, if it fails it. to scan the ID, mm -hmm. then you you can also search by alphanumeric. So you can put in the name of the person, and it will pop up. But still, even but then how will you identify if my name pops up? That the picture is, will also okay. show. Right. So it will show the name. It uh -huh. will show the names. It will show the picture. Then we can compare. The clerk will compare the picture with what they have and what they have here, and then you will be allowed to vote. But even in that case out of abundance of caution, we are also allow, uh, in, in insisting that the person fills the 32, Form 32A, mm -hmm. which is the complementary mechanism of being identified. Because for us, the default, the, the basic, the primary way of identifying you has to be the biometrics. Mm -hmm. So if we use any of those methods, then we are going to consider that complementary and we are going to have you sign the 32 form, whereby you'll have agents come look through, ensure that uh, you are the person mm -hmm. that you claim you are, uh -huh. and then you'll be allowed to vote. Then there is a second level, which we really hope we don't get to, mm -hmm. which is where the gadget completely fails yeah. all over the country. Yeah. Uh, as I mean, we saw in 2013. Yeah, which yeah. is really where we don't want to go as yeah. a country. Uh -huh. But maybe before I go there, in case the gadget fails in a polling station, uh -huh. one of them fails, before we go to the next one, what we do is that we give you another one. We have made how many gadgets? We have made uh, about we've, we've made about five thousand more okay. that are available, and we're going to put them in close-up 
proximity to the, to the various uh, constituencies so mm -hmm. that we can be able to use it. If that gadget fails, if the second gadget fails, then, then uh, that's when you go into the complementary mechanism, the full one, whereby in this case you're going to use the printed register okay. and we are back to 2013. Right. <laughs> whereby, you know, so whereby you're identified yeah. manually and then you check your name out of the register and you're given a ballot to vote. Okay. Mm -hmm. Results transmission? Results that's transmission yeah. uh, is also, you use the Kim's technology yeah. to transfer. In case of failure, then uh, you will do what uh, the High Courts, uh, the Court of Appeal talked about, where you have 290 uh, constituency returning officers trooping. Mm -hmm. to Nairobi to, uh, to submit their results. I mean, that is a, that so is a complementary manual. mechanism. I've obviously, it is manual, yeah, and yeah. it is provided for in the law, yeah, Yvonne. Yeah, yeah. There, that is not something mm. that the IBC has mm -hmm. come up with. It is something that is provided for in the law. Finally, if you can, in a minute, um, there's a lot happening. I mean, I think IBC has faced as many legal challenges. Uh, some in the political sphere say the judiciary might be hampering the work of the IBC. What is that message? In case I don't speak to you again, because I spoke to you a hundred, I think what, it was a hundred days ago yes, now, yes. and here we are. Mm -hmm. um, in case this is the last time you are on checkpoint, mm -hmm. and we hope that it isn't, mm -hmm. what is that assurance? Do you have the bare minimum that the management body, the electoral management body has to conduct a free, fair, credible election 21 days from today? Yvonne, I think we're very ready. I think we have put all our tools together. We have done more than six trainings nationwide for different programs of our staff. We have ensured that the, the, the training that we're giving to all our staff is consistent. Unlike 2013, everybody who, who is going to be working as a staff member for us has, have, has had access to work on this technology. We have tested this technology. We've, uh, trained, we've, them trained, okay. we've trained people. We have reduced the number of uh, classes, the class size. You know, in 2013, you were having 60, 70 people in our class. We have reduced that to 35, 30, 35 people so that they have a full experience with the technology. We've been working on issues of uh, code of conduct where people are violating the law. Uh, you know, when you look at the whole spectrum of things that an EMB, an election management body needs to do, we are there. I mean, when you check our timelines and you see what we were expected to do at certain times, when, if Kenyans are frank, they will be able to say, despite the challenges, mm -hmm. we have never gone to parliament and said, parliament, please extend this time for this period. Right. We've never had to request for that. Is the judiciary an impediment? We have, full the work of IBC? For, we have full respect for the judiciary. It's an important actor. Mm -hmm. It's an important Important organ in our constitution. We respect the, 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 the decisions of the judiciary and we hope that uh, just like we saw you know, a lot of Kenyans come out and defend the judiciary when it was under attack, we really look forward to that one day when the Kenyan people can also come up and defend the independence of the IBC and say that we have a body that has been charged to deliver free, fair and credible elections and let's give them a chance. We have our staff members spending days and nights mm -hmm. Uh, up to now, we have staff in Utali yeah. uh -huh. spend, uh, still training and preparing for the election. So we just urge that the Kenyan people give us a chance to be able to deliver this free, fair and credible election. Okay. Of course, the truth of that will be on the 9th <laughs> and the 10th of August. Thank you very much, <laughs> Dr. Roslyn Akombe, for coming in and for uh, speaking to us about your preparedness as we head towards the election. It's the final days. I thank you very much for making the time thank you, to Yvonne. be with us. I Dr. Rosalind Akombe.